We don't want people to feel pain. We don't want people to experience negative emotions, right? But maybe experiencing that might be the catalyst for the biggest change that they make in their life. Welcome to the Path Podcast. I'm Mike Salemi. I believe that uncharted trails make the best life stories. So take a deep breath, put one foot in front of the other, and trust the ground under your feet. Join me in discussions on health, performance, business, leadership, and spiritual self-mastery because these topics are windows into how well each of us have learned to trust our own path. Let's go. This is a Soul Fire production. Today on the podcast, we've got Stephen Jaggers. Now, Stephen is the co-founder of Somatic Breathwork. And let me start off by saying breath and breathwork is something that I've incorporated into my practice in some way, shape or form for probably the last 15 years. But it's always been more for the intention around fitness and performance. And it really hasn't been until the last five or so years that I've taken a, a much deeper interest and dive into exploring different forms of breathwork for the sake or the purpose of experiencing greater healing healing in life and understanding trauma at a deeper level. You know, as you'll learn in this podcast, the breath is the only rhythm in the body that we do both consciously and unconsciously. And it is such an access point to understanding and connecting with parts of ourselves that we may have disconnected to over the years for a whole myriad of reasons. And in this podcast, I really do believe that this is basically like a masterclass. I mean, Stephen is so articulate with his experience and understanding of breath work and what it can do and the, and the potential of it for once again, connecting with ourselves, connecting deeper with those around us. And actually, right before we recorded today's podcast, he guided me through a few minutes of of some light breathing exercises. And it's just so amazing at how quickly we can change our states just by focusing on the breath and intentional breath. And it's one of the most powerful things that I've used over the years to support myself, to support clients, to support the men at the men's retreat that I lead now. And his form of breath work, somatic release, has been so influential on me that I actually got certified in it. And so in this podcast, you're going to to learn so much once again about breathing, about trauma, uh, the goal of the type of breath work that he leads, his mission in life, and really why it is taking off at such a global level. So get ready. I know you're going to learn a ton on this one. Let's get right into it with Steven Jaggers. What we just did was essentially a, an abbreviated format of how you lead somatic release breath work. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, spy, kind of spiking your nervous system a little bit with those, uh, those deep uh, inhales and exhales through the mouth. And then, you know, dropping yourself into a nice, deep, relaxed state afterwards. I usually can sink that much more into a relaxed state after I've kind of spiked my system up a little bit. Mm. I remember when I was first having a call with you and this was before I had taken the certification and I was curious about, you know, the format protocols, what you guys basically do. And as one of the things that really stood out to me, and this is also one of the things that I describe somatic release breath work to people in terms of having experienced all different sorts of breath work techniques from training for performance to some of this deeper healing work. One of the big aspects that really stuck out to me was the fact on how you've arranged the actual technique to where the second half of the breath work is about down regulation of the nervous system. So I'm curious about uh, why that is and what you've really seen having that down regulation, that nasal breathing on the second half of it. Yeah. You know, there's so many aspects um, to that. It's, it kind of speaks to, we live in a duality, right? We live in a world of, of polarity. And I think that studying lots of different modalities from different types of body work to different types of, um, you know, athletic performance and functional training, you have to incorporate both sides. I mean, Paul Check, who's a buddy of yours, he has, you know, if you work out, you got to work in. <laughs> Right. And so I've noticed that a lot of modalities don't necessarily have both sides. And so I've been to plenty of breath works where it's all about clearing and amping up the nervous system and really taking people into a dysregulated state, which there are benefits to that. But where do you want to spend most of your life at? You want to spend it in a regulated state, right? You want to spend it in that relaxed state. So spiking the nervous system first, giving people an opportunity to discharge, to release. And then we don't just want to leave them there. Um, after they've like spiked it and had that sort of release, we want to show the nervous system how 
well, first off that it has permission to go there. Like it has permission to fully express itself. And then also how to come back to a relaxed state, like how to downregulate it. And there's so much, there's so many other um, facets to that, but I feel like it really, it, it, I, I just noticed where different modalities were missing kind of both sides. And I think that we live in a world of duality. We live in a world of polarity. We need both yin and yang. We need both working in and working out. Absolutely. And I think too, like to that point, most people, at least that I've experienced, most people are coming in in an excessively stressed state. Yeah. Right. And so again, to your point, exactly like there is a time and a place and an intention, use that word intention to ramp yeah. people up. But ideally what I've really seen in now leading this breath work for, I don't know, the last few, maybe six months or so I took the cert has really been, or maybe more than that, but has really been people are leaving maybe more put together. Yeah, like absolutely. The, like able to hit the ground running after a session, as opposed to being all about the release. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't really understand that um, when you are uh, doing these more intense breathwork sessions, um, you are mimicking a state of trauma. Mm. You are mimicking a physiolog physiological state of distress in your system, which can be beneficial. It does give your organism an opportunity to discharge. What we're doing is we're creating a safe container where we can take someone's physiology into a state. We're mimicking a stress state, which gives their body, their physiology an, a chance to discharge, which, you know, is a lot of the work of Peter Levine and body keeps the score and waking the tiger is that your body needs to complete the necessary action that it needed to do in the moment of that stressor. We become such a mentally dominant culture that we've rationalized the shit that we've gone through. We've like, you know, been able to work with the story, but doesn't mean that your body doesn't still feel like it's in the presence of a tiger. And so whatever your physical body needed to do in the presence of that stressor, whether it needed to cry, whether it needed to scream, whether it needed to yell, whether it needed to be super angry, we usually don't have places and spaces to be able to do that. And it's very hard to do that in your normal everyday waking state. So when you're breathing, like if I was being chased by a tiger, how would I be breathing? <sighs> So we're mimicking a state of stress or a state of trauma in that. And so if you just leave them there and you actually don't know what you're doing, not so beneficial. And so we want to give people that opportunity. And then at the same time, after that, show the system how to come back into a relaxed state, how to downregulate itself, where it should spend most of its time you know, cause we should be operating from that place. But, and for anybody that's listening, that listening, that's stressed, if you're stressed out, try to just go relax. Like it's actually really hard. Like for me, when I'm stressed out, I probably want to go to the gym. Well, why do I want to go to the gym? Because I need to physically exercise it out. I've had people say they've watched my videos and they're like, are you performing exorcism? Well, <laughs> it depends what your definition of exorcism. Cause Exor exercising is just a, a movement of energy from the center out of the body, right? So exercising is, a, is essentially a, a part of an exorcism. It's, it's physically moving that energy out of your system. So if I'm stressed, it's going to be hard for me to just like go to sleep or relax. I need to go physically discharge it. And then I usually can relax and sink in that much more to a, to a relaxed state. Dude, that makes total sense. And like, I don't remember if we did this in the training, but I've done this in just my own practice and stuff. Sometimes laying down before breath work, I'll clench everything. I'll squeeze my fists, yeah. make, you know, my biceps super hard, squeeze my quads. And I'll just hold that for a few seconds and then relax. Yeah. And I'll do some oscillations back and forth. And it truly is incredible. Sometimes we have to create a more excitatory state, if that's the right word, uh, Makes sense. <laughs> in order to actually feel the contrast and actually yeah. open up the window for that to be possible. Yeah. I noticed like, you know, I was a neuromuscular therapist for a long time and, and worked really with people on a postural level. Okay. And, um, and you know, I was doing a lot of, uh, and stretching and, you know, uh, myofascial release and a lot of those sort of techniques on people. And I would see people come in over and over and over again with the same stuff. And like, I'd work on them, I'd get them back to like sort of an aligned state and then they'd come back in. And there's a, there's an aspect of like, well, that part of their body, it's not that it's tight or it's actually that they don't even have access to that part of their body. Hmm. They're not even occupying that part of their body. 
Like for those of you that have got, went and got a massage or had someone press on like your hip and you're like, holy shit, that's tender over there. Well, you're not even aware of that part of your body. You don't even know what's going on. You're not even occupying that part. And so there's an aspect of where I would have people try to turn that part of their body on that mind muscle connection that so many bodybuilders talk about, like being able to have access to that part. Then I would realize, okay, let's actually run life force. Let's run your awareness and have access to that part of your body. And then you're able to, you know, your, your nervous system gives you so much more access to range of motion, to different positions, right? Because it trusts you. There's a part of your body that's that, um, the, the electrical circuit is, is dark there, right? You don't actually, you're not even running life force or you could say life force or consciousness, but really it's, it's, it's neuromuscular access to that part of your body. Mm, wow. I love that, man. Tying to something that you shared earlier and then even before we were recording, you've got a super unique perspective or a perspective that I really feel should be shared around why the F do we do this type of work? Like yeah. why you know, so much emphasis on exploring these parts of ourselves, doing this self-healing work or the trauma work, what, what comes up for you in that? You know, I, I continue to, and I think that's something that, um, people should ask themselves, like, why do you like whatever the thing that you're doing, or if you are in a service oriented position, you're working with other humans, why are you doing the things that you're doing? Because I studied lots of different modalities and I would continue to ask myself that. And, and eventually I'd be like, is this actually helping people? And then I would realize that, okay, there's aspects that are, there's aspects that aren't, but why do we do this sort of deeper nervous system, like trauma release work? Really what it is, it's a self inquiry practice. So what that means is to go inside and connect to yourself because there is a disconnect. Like I said, most people aren't even occupying their body. They don't even know what's going on in their body. They're not occupying their emotions. And so their emotions are occupying them, right? Mm. And so to do this work is to reconnect to yourself, to all parts of yourself, not just your psyche, but your body, your mind, your emotions. You know, one of the quotes from Gabor Mate says, trauma is a disconnect from the real self. Because whatever happened in the moment was too much for you to handle. And so there's a disconnect from the real self. Well, then healing is actually just a reconnection. And so doing this work, it allows you to reconnect to parts of yourself. And when you reconnect to yourself, it allows you to connect to other people. I think that the opposite, you know, Gabor Mate again says the opposite of addiction is connection. The opposite of isolation is connection. And so we are disconnected as humanity we are dis but even on a on a more micro scale we're disconnected to our body and so that makes us disconnected to our food that we're eating that makes us disconnected to the planet right the dissociation of our mind to our body is the same dissociation of humanity and on a global level like right now you know there's people dumping toxins or or whatever it is in the ocean right well the intelligence of your body like on a cellular level, your cells know that you are connected to all living things, that eventually the water in the ocean or the water in the river that people are dumping toxins in hundred miles away, that will make up the water in the body of your children. So your body knows that. And so we think that if it's okay, it's happening over there, it's not happening here. The same thing happens inside our body. Well, we don't even actually know what's happening in different areas of our body. And so with this this somatic breath work, it's to occupy your soma. Soma is the Greek word for, I mean, there's lots of different interpretations of it, but it is to, of your, your body, your physical vessel in connection to your psyche, which I believe the psyche is actually not your, it's not in your body. It's what your soma is tuning into. And we could go down lots of routes from there. Um, but why, why do this work to begin with? It's to develop healthy relationships. Mm. So I can reconnect to myself and then I can actually be my own self in relationship to another person. Because so many people have had to hold up this like avatar of themselves or this character. So it's actually not them in relationship to other people. It's a representative of them. And so they're actually not in connection to their significant other or to their child. 
or in their community. It's a representative of them. And that representative is a lot of the times driven by our undigested emotions, the things that we have, our undigested experiences, the wounds that we have that want to be felt because they want, we are a verb, we are a process, we are a movement of energy and whatever is not expressed usually gets suppressed. And then that wants to find a way to be expressed. And if we're not consciously doing it, then it will leak out into our, probably the relationships that are closest to us. We will end up lashing out on the people that we love. And so really I ask myself, why do we do this work? It's to develop a healthy relationship to ourselves, so that we can connect to other people so that we can commune, right? I believe that that communing is one of our deepest purposes on this planet mm. to be in community, to be in communication, to connect with each other, plants, animals, the planet that we're on. Something that you shared brings up like a curiosity for me and, and you've now led breath work for, for, I don't know, a few years now at least, and then yeah. started somatic release breath work, body worker, a huge background in that. I'm curious when people are experiencing, let's just say they're, you know, they're their own self-healing on the mat or on the table, what comes up for you or what have you observed as a prerequisite for someone before they can either experience a type of release or what, what is happening inside of them or if they communicate or you observed for them to even allow themselves to access that. Are you talking about from like someone who is receiving or participating in the practice? Yeah. Someone who's a participant in the session. Yeah. What would be like a prerequisite? Yeah. Is there like in order for, cause if I'm Mm -hmm. like, I'm just thinking like if I'm super angry and I'm just not ready to go there, no matter how, Like what, what helps someone give themselves permission if we want to say that, or what helps them enter into being open to more of this work? Yeah, there is, um, there's so much there. Mm. One thing that I love about this work is it's so accessible, right? Mm. You, everyone breathes. Mm. It's the only body rhythm that you do both consciously and unconsciously, meaning that you can think about it and we can take a breath in right now or I don't have to think about it and I'm still going to have this conversation. I'm still going to be breathing. So (laughs) it is like, it is an access point. It is a button that we have that we can actually change the state of our system. Like we can change our nervous system state. We can, if we're feeling closed off, we can change it to a more open state. We're feeling like super open and we need to come back inside. We can, you know, it, it will control if we're in a state of fear or if we're in a state of openness, like, and we have the control of that. Most people have given up control, right? They've lost their sovereignty to prescription medications and all of the different paradigms that are going on in our world right now, which I'm not going to get into. But one thing that I'm really passionate about and helping people remember is that healing doesn't operate on time. Our world operates on time. Our healing does not. And so we look at social media, we look at Instagram and we see um, people killing it. We see people like, you know, we, we see all the positive parts of, of people's experience. We don't see how much time it has taken to get there. And we live in a world of instant gratification. Mm-hmm. And so helping people understand that a little bit at a time is okay. Mm-hmm. Like your body changes slowly. Your body is just like these plants over here. It changes slowly. And when you have a quick change, when you have like a massive release, that actually can be a little intense for people. Mm. And so a little bit at a time is okay. And I think that changing the paradigm to honor people's like slow, gradual transformation instead of like, let me just take a pill and it'll be all better right then. Like, so it's the, it's the mindset going into it that I can just explore it a little bit. I don't have to go into this full on catharsis, right? What are the aspects of myself that I'm ready to kind of go into? And that's the thing about breath work. It's not like you're (laughs) ingesting mushrooms or ayahuasca and those are the thing that are taking you for a ride. You're in control the whole time. Mm. You can go in a little bit if you want, or you can go deeper. You're the one in control. And so knowing that you have the option to maybe go a little bit into it and explore, or you can go further into it. I see so many people that really they want to be healed and they want to be healed now. Well, no one's ever healed. We're all just healing and we're all dying at the same time. And so it's a constant process and it's going to continue and we're going to accumulate more shit as we move through the world. And so getting used to this like slow, gradual change 
right? I super appreciate that. And I, it feels way more empowering yeah. you know, to know that all this stuff, 35 years of shit that I've experienced or whoever's listening, it's like, it doesn't all have to happen in one moment. And in yeah. fact, it's probably going to be more productive. If it happens gradual and like, right. that's going to be more empowering, likely and more sustainable. And I'm curious, you know, this was, uh, we were talking also before we were recording, uh, this was a, a friend and, and also a client who shared something with me. And I imagine that you've gotten this too, where after a breathwork session, someone might say, oh my gosh, like you healed me or something like that. Yeah. Use those words. And I really appreciate your perspective on it. Um, so has that happened to you? And, and how have you found uh, to respond to that in a way that really feels authentic and true to you? Yeah, I, um, I don't resonate with the term healer. Yep. I think that all of us are healers. Um, but we're only healing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like we're repairing ourselves on a cellular level every day. We're digesting our food. We are beating our heart. We're breathing. Like all these autonomic functions are going on all the time. And we, we don't even have to consciously be aware of it. And so if you go to the doctor and say you have a massive cut on your arm, that doctor doesn't heal your cut. He'll stitch it up. He puts you in position mm. for your body to heal itself. And so my take is that I'm working with the sort of innate intelligence of the body that our nervous system has adapted for thousands of years of evolutionary biology and has certain processes has, it has to go through. We can't, we can't bypass the nature of our body, right? Even though we live in a very modern world, we can't bypass the nature of our body. So coming from it in a way where I'm supporting the natural processes of the body so that it can heal itself. Most people haven't been given permission to actually feel emotion right? In our world, if someone's crying, we want to run over to them and be like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Mm. But really what we're saying is no, 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 stop. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm actually not okay with you feeling because it's making me feel something not, and, and it's actually not okay to feel. It's a difference between that and going over to them. Like it's okay to let yourself feel it and I'll be here with you while you're, while you're in that. And so that term holding space has been thrown around so much and I could go into that and like the applicable, like, what does that actually mean? But when you're holding space for somebody, you're holding space for someone to actually take up space. A lot of us have never felt like we can take up space or our emotions are actually not welcome in the space. And so what is it, what would it mean if we had places, spaces, relationships, um, patterns in our culture that were woven in that allow people to feel their humanness and to, 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 to have a non-judgmental space where people are actually able to feel because we're feeling creatures. We're born with the birthright to feel. We come out of this world feeling everything. And over time through different cultural and societal impressions, um, it blocks our expression, right? And so we're taught that it's not okay, but really inside, you know, kids know this so well, you know, they'll, they, something happens and they throw a temper tantrum because the intelligence of their body knows that it doesn't want to hold on to that. It wants to move it through them. And if it gets bottled up, well, I just wonder how, you know, there was a school shooting here not that long ago. Mm. Like think about that. That's, that's an expression of violence. That's an expression of anger. That's probably been bottled up for a long time. Wondering if, if, if those individuals had a place where someone, you know, an empathetic witness was there to kind of hold space for them to express that anger in a healthy way. Like, would that have happened? And so that energy, that energy in motion, that emotion is going to find a way to, to, to be expressed. It's just, do we have ways to express it in a healthy way? One of my, uh, coaches and mentors. He's actually the first guest on the podcast. Yaakov Darling Khan is his name. He's out in the UK. And one of the things in that episode, and then in our work together, he's really been an incredible support. And I guess you could say just guide in me understanding a new lens on anger, that yeah. it is a very necessary and actually a healthy emotion oh, yeah. to experience. But it's when we don't express it yeah. that it turns out to anger as violence. 
and it becomes Absolutely. less of an ally and becomes more of an actual destructive force. 100% anger. You know, if somebody is, um, attacking my family, mm -hmm. I'm going to be angry. If someone is bullying me when I'm a child, I'm going to be angry. And so the last thing we want to do is stop ourselves from feeling that because that anger is telling us where a boundary is. And so a lot of the times when people haven't given, haven't been given permission to feel anger, they don't, they don't have solid boundaries. And so they will either get walked on or they'll flip the flip that and then they'll walk on everyone else, right? They'll use that as a sort of driving force. You know, I get so many people that say, well, I'm just not an angry person. <laughs> It's not the angry per it's not the person that can express anger that it that is an angry person. It's the person that hasn't been able to express anger, then they become an angry person because that anger is still inside and it's being harbored. Mm. Right. And so the last thing we want to do is to make like critical decisions in that emotional state. And so if we're able to have a healthy outlet for that anger then it moves through us. Then our decision-making isn't clouded by that emotion, right? And so then it, it, it shows us where a boundary is needed. You know, anger is the element of fire. It creates change, creates transformation. So necessary. Just we, we, um, we need to learn healthy ways to express it. You know what comes up, and this is something I find fascinating, and I'd love to hear just your observation and experience with it. In a breathwork session, the release or the purge can show up in so many different ways. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about what are some of like the healthy ways that people can express themselves in, in a breathwork session? Yeah. In a, in a, in a breathwork session, it's interesting because a lot of people I feel like have um, release envy in a way, hmm. especially in group sessions, like they'll hear another person crying and they actually don't, you know, they're not feeling like crying is an authentic like release for them. And so they're like, oh shit, am I not doing it right? Am I supposed to cry or am I supposed to release anger? And so whatever is coming up is coming up to move through you. And so we are an expression vessel. We can dance, we can move, we can sing, we can cry, we can yell. All of those different movements of energy through our system, none of them are bad or good. Mm. We've put a lens on them as bad or good. They're all just movements of energy through our system. And so those expressions, like I said earlier, could be something that you needed to do, something that your physical body needed to do in the presence of whatever stressor that you went through or whatever traumatic incident, incident that happened, and you didn't have the ability to do that. But your body still needs to complete that necessary action. So maybe it's shaking. Maybe it's yelling. You know, I, I had someone the other day that was just yelling no over and over. Like, and she, and I don't know what's going on in the session. You know, I don't necessarily know exactly what they're going through. It's their session. She was yelling no the whole time. And that was what needed to be expressed. And she said that she had been um, sexually abused as a child. And that was the thing that she needed to do in the present moment was to say no, was to yell no, was to say, get the fuck off me. And so it could be that. It could be laughing. Sometimes I go like, there's people that just go on into a full on like laughter release or joy. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people actually don't let themselves feel good. Don't let themselves feel sensual. You know, there's an aspect of that too. I get a lot of people, men and women, where that's an expression that's been suppressed for so long. And so being able to move that sort of energy through their system is, is very freeing. It's probably been suppressed for a very long time. With this type of work, I'm curious, and it kind of touches on what we were talking about earlier about people putting maybe the responsibility of their healing onto yeah. the practitioner. I'm curious in a session, like how have you found when people are putting that, not just a healer, but like are having these full on experiences that they maybe want to attach to you? Yeah. How have you found the ability to navigate that with men and women? It's a good one, man. Um, I think it's a deeper thing because the way in which our system, especially our health system is set up, it's set up in a sort of fix it mentality. And so there is the healer and then there's the person to be healed. Like I have an issue with my body. I want to go to the doctor and the doctor is going to heal me. Right. 
I have whatever's going, I have some sort of um, dysfunction in my body movement wise. I'm going to go to Mike Salemi. He's going to fix me, <laughs> right? How many people put that pressure on you? Dude. And then they, they come and you do one session with them and then they're like, well, my hip's not better. What? And so there's a tremendous amount of pressure on both sides, right? Because they're giving away their power. Mm -hmm. They're giving away their own sovereignty in their system. Nobody knows you better than you. Nobody knows me better than me. And so it's changing the sort of fix it mentality. And like, you have to ask yourself as a practitioner, if you are playing the archetype of the healer, then you are actually seeing this other person is broken because that's what happens in, in, in the world. If I'm thinking that I'm going to heal you or if I'm going to fix you, then something must be broken. And actually no one's broken. Most people are just stuck. Wow. Well, there's something that's stuck within them. So I change it to, to like, how can I honor the intelligence of this person's body that my mind can't even fathom the intelligence of what it takes to beat someone's heart. Like, what is that energy that's beat? Are you beating your heart? Like, are you digesting your food? Like our minds can't even fathom the intelligence of our body. So if I put myself in the mindset, in the state where I'm honoring all of the things that are working for you, that's a massive shift. And I think that's like a massive, massive shift for our like health paradigm. How can we work with the intelligence of the body? And to answer your question from the other side, you know, someone putting that on me, well, I have to put the power back into their hands. Like I didn't do that for you. Mm -hmm. You did that for yourself. And specifically within the technique that, you know, I teach is that, I'm going to work on them a lot in the beginning of the session, but then I'm going to actually give them a lot of space. And I want them to feel like they did it for themselves. And so if I was there with them all the whole time, you know, like working on them the whole time, I actually don't give them enough space for them to do it themselves because they're the ones completing that necessary action that their body needed to do. And so I always put the power back into their hands. You're the one that did this. I didn't do it. I held the space for you to, to get there. We collaborated in it. And so it was a collaboration, but you were the one that did this. If the topics that Steven and I are discussing in this podcast resonate with you and really have piqued your curiosity in terms of what can breath work and more specifically, what can this style of breath work, somatic breath work do for you and you want to experience it firsthand, then I'm very excited to share that I am offering 25% off of first time sessions of people experiencing this breath work with me. And all you got to do is go to mikesalemi.io. I'll also put a link in the show notes. There'll be an application for you to fill out and my assistant, Lindy, will follow up with you to give you more information and more details on it. But there's really no better way with this modality than to experience it firsthand if especially you think the topics and what we're discussing here really feel like it could be something that could be helpful and supportive to you with whatever you're going through right now in life. Now, if you are a practitioner or a coach and you actually want to get certified in somatic breathwork, I'm happy to say that Somatic Breathwork and Steven has offered $175 off of their certification. And all you got to do is use code Michael3463. When you go to somaticbreathwork.com, I will also put that in the show notes. Now let's get right back to the show. You know, what comes up here in that too is in a session that I think I was in with you. And I don't even recall if it was me or something that I observed, but I remember this, this vision of like, you were either with me, I think, just holding holding me and I was going through it. And then you had placed my hands back on my heart. Yeah. And you stepped away. What I took from that was just that was such an empowering thing where you held me when I needed to be held. And then you allowed me the grace and the and the empowerment to like, you got this. And yeah. it was so like I remember just the feeling, or again, I don't even fully recall if it was me because I was so in it, or I saw it or something. But I just remember this, this scene of just like, wow, this person's got it or I've got it. And that's really what I've taken away from that. And that was huge, man. Yeah, man. Sus real sustainable change has to happen from the inside out, right? Mm. We've all, um, you know, I can, and I'm sure people can relate, like, you know, I've tried to work with my family. <laughs> I've tried to work with like my, my, um, my parents or 
and say, Hey, you should try this. Hey, you should do this. Right. And where is that sort of agenda coming? Like, I want to, I want to fix them. And a lot of the times we're coming from like a well-intentioned place, but we actually don't know what's helping people. We actually don't know. At the end of the day, we don't know what's best for people. And so we don't want people to feel pain. We don't want people to experience negative emotions, right? But maybe experiencing that might be the catalyst for the biggest change that they make in their life. In in a sense, a lot of us are kind of robbing people of of doing it for themselves. Mm. And so there's an aspect of like, yes, I'm going to be there fully with you while you're in it. But then I'm going to give you space because that's life. I'm going to be there fully with you in it. And then I'm not, you know, it's the concept of integration. I think that, that people that we have sort of a, um, we don't necessarily have the right definition of that. You know, we, we look at integration, I think, and I've been sitting with integration because so many people ask me like, how can I integrate yeah. better? And I think that's a topic that comes up within all modalities, right? From somatic understanding and, and somatic psychology, integration is actually what's happening actually during the session. Really? Like, and in, and you could take like, um, like during a, a psychedelic session, um, you know, I, I worked with the nonprofit organization maps. I volunteered with them and got to learn a lot of the science behind what's going on, like from a brain scan level, but integration is actually the reconnection of the parts of yourself. It's actually you making that reconnection. You're integrating parts of yourself. You're integrating your past, right? Presence, being able to be present in the moment is integrated history, like an integrated past means that I can be present. Like I can't be present with you if I'm still thinking about what happened earlier this morning, if I'm still integrating my experiences from fighting with my significant other this morning, Mm -hmm. I can't be present with you. So the integration is actually, is what is happening in the moment, like during the actual session, the, the parts of yourself, the compartmentalization that happens when we, I mean, it's interesting because when people say they had like, we've all heard, and let's just use the example of psychedelics because this is an easy one. People say they had a bad trip. Sure. Right? Well, or it, really it's a difficult experience. But what happens is that it's a lot of the times the people that have very rigid belief systems, like really rigid thinking, like religion is compartmentalized and then like science is compartmentalized and then like sexuality is compartmentalized. And during like, a psychedelic session or even a breathwork session, a lot of the compartmentalization of the parts of your brain, those walls come down and you start to integrate and connect the dots between science, spirituality, my sexuality, whatever it is, all of the different parts of yourself. And a lot of the people, a lot of people have a very hard time when parts of themselves get integrated because they've lived their life from a compartmentalized, like a very rigid belief system. Right. And so the integration is what's happening in the present moment, like during when you're having that experience. And so it's not this belief of like, okay, I'm going to take these insights and I'm going to go live them out in the world. That's an aspect of them. But I think that people have an idea of integration as, okay, I'm going to like, after this, I'm going to go live my dream life. Right. What? Well, so many people are like, well, can you help me integrate better? I'm, and, that, and that's coming from a place of like, they want me to be their parent. Mm. They want me to sit there and tell them what to do all the time. Nobody can integrate for you. You have to integrate for yourself. And so you have to connect those dots, right? I can hold the space for that. I can help you reconnect to your hip flexion, if you will, you know, or whatever it is, or, or maybe it's anger that you've been experiencing, but you have to be the one to go out and put that into place, right? Nobody can do that for you. You have to be the one to weave that into the patterns of your, your day-to-day life. And what I found that works best for integration is having a community where I can go be this new version of myself. And I can have other people that accept me for that. Because what happens is people, okay, people are going to go do the integration for themselves, right? Because nobody can integrate for you, but they go back into their day-to-day life and all of the people in their life, their parents or their significant other, they have a certain projection of what, who they think you are. Well, 
you're actually a process. You're a change. You're, you're a different person every day and you have the opportunity. And so creating a community that allows people to be a new person every day allows them to integrate. I know that's a lot, but does that make sense? That's the first time I've heard of integration described like that. And I think it is really fascinating. And, and I, it feels true for me too, that like actual integration is happening in the session, but I never viewed it from that perspective before. And then in terms of the community piece, I think that's huge because really what you're doing is you're changing the environment. The analogy that I've actually, I think I may have shared on a podcast before, but it's like if a fish in a fish tank is sick, what's one of the first things that you do? Check the water and change the water, right? So the environment, the community, even like going back home, like I'll, I'll sometimes make this suggestion too. It's like just switching around the furniture. You've been so used to the same people, the same way of things. Like you need to re, or it could be helpful to reorient things. Absolutely, man. And that, um, that goes into a massive topic that like is deeper than just ourselves in a way. But most of our trauma responses, most of our stress responses are actually a very normal response to an abnormal environment. Hmm. Like hmm. <laughs> most of our stressors, our traumas are very normal. We just live in a very abnormal environment for our humanness. And you could take that on a physical level, like say you're working with somebody and you're helping them like, you know, integrate new parts of their body, like from a movement perspective. Well, if they go sit in a chair after that, it's just, they're just going to go back into those same patterns. Mm. And so the tension or the dysfunction in their body is a very normal response to an abnormal environment. And you're not what you do. Sometimes you're not like a person is not just the hour that they go spend with me doing a session or the hour that they go spend with you just doing a session. They are what they repeatedly do. Mm -hmm. And so there's a bigger aspect of doing that work and then having like an environment, a community that accepts you and you as a process, you as a change, you as a verb that allows you to like become Cause there is that will to become with inside of us. Right. That's so spot on. And, what, and even what that brings up too, is potentially having a conversation with the people that we love that are used to us in a certain sure. way and just opening up that dialogue. Because like uh, I've heard, you know, even through uh, family that have been, or friends, for example, that have been curious and they've seen my evolution over the years. It's like, well, when's enough, when's enough. And I, it's been even hard for me to find a language and you just put words to just what's felt true for me inside that. Like we are a process and like as it's, it's a process of layers and layers and layers, but it's the same thought of like, when, when are you healed? When is this enough? That's the same mindset Mm -hmm. that I feel like can keep me trapped in that same box. Yeah. It's trying to get to the end point, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Alan Watts, um, one of my favorite like sort of quotes and I might butcher it is like when you're dancing with your partner, the goal is not to get to a place in the room, <laughs> right? When you're playing a song, like when I'm playing music, the goal is not to get to the end of the song. The goal is to be in it. Right. And so it's that sort of endpoint mindset that let's get to 65 and retire. It's actually to to be alive fully here now in presence with each other. Like what a fucking gift. I remember reading about some Native American languages and how language actually controls like so much of our paradigm. Mm. Cause we they in their language, they actually don't have any nouns, which is interesting. Like there is no person, place, or thing. Everything is a verb. Everything is moving. And that is the only thing that's constant, right? Is change. And so I think that a lot of people, we crave stasis, right? We crave comfort. We want things to be the same. Like I want you, like I can feel people that I might've went to high school with or that I were best friends with. Like they want me to be that same person. And, and then like, I can feel them like almost projecting that onto me. And it's like, actually, no, I've grown a lot from that person. And so I can feel that they're trying to keep me in that box. And then when I show up and I'm in relation with them and I'm a new person, they're trying to force 
that version of me into that box, right? And it's actually, no, I've actually changed. I'm different. And so even in relationship with like a significant other, I know that like that is such a practice is like letting that person become a new person every day. And that will actually keep the fire alive in your relationship. As soon as you think you know this person, the relationship kind of dies. There's no space for them to become a new version of themselves, to become that process, that change that keeps things like full of life, right? That's so true, man. What's coming up now is why are you on this mission? Why are you so excited about the work that you're doing? Having now seen, and even just in the last year, somatic release breathwork kind of really take off. But like, I'm really curious, why are you doing this work? It's so hard at this point. I really tune into that. And I, I feel, it sounds a little woo woo, but like, I, um, I don't see anything else worth spending my time before it's my time. I mean, to have a background on me, like my parents were both addicts, like significant drug addicts. They um, were addicted to meth. And so like I, and I'm an only child. And so I watched my parents really struggle when I was, you know, they, when I was like, they were on those drugs when they had me, technically I'm a meth baby, you know? And so they, um, they ended up going to rehab when I was about three and, um, changed their life around and, um, you know, got clean from those hard drugs and quickly switched to prescription medications. And, you know, I didn't know that at the time I was very young, but I could feel in my body that some, something was off. I could feel that so like I could, like when you're that young, you're so sensitive, you're, you're co-regulating and that co-regulation precedes self-regulation. Meaning that when we're children, we learn to co-regulate with each other and that helps us self-regulate. Like I use the example of, say it was your first time on an airplane and the airplane was experiencing turbulence and you've never experienced an airplane before. And you're like, Oh fuck, like this is scary. But you look around and no one else is freaking out. And so your system's going to be like, ah, well, everything, they're okay. Like, I guess everything must be okay. Like we co-regulate with each other first and that allows us to self-regulate. And so at a young age, I'm co-regulating with people that are very dysregulated, people that are operating off of, you know, a lot of, a lot of pain, a lot of wounding. And so I watched them switch to prescription medications and go from, you know, uh, six month uh, rounds of, okay, I'm going to try this prescription medication. And, and then it's like, okay, that one didn't work. I'm going to go back to the doctor and I'm going to, you know, okay, this prescription medication is going to make me feel better. This prescription medication is going to allow me to like go to your sports games. And I watched and I, I felt I could feel the struggle. And I started to see other families and their struggles. I think I was always just very aware. And, um, you know, I went down a route of being very physically athletic and playing a lot of sports and also really wanting to study psychology. And I couldn't decide which route to go on. Do I go down the physical therapy route of like understanding the body? I went down that route a little bit. And then do I go down? I went down the route of addiction psychology. And I think, you know, then I ended up kind of scrapping both of that because I just didn't, I didn't vibe with like traditional um, schooling. But I think a lot of it stems probably because wanting to help them. But then seeing them and their struggles and realizing that, you know, they, they did the best that they could. It was passed down. Mm. Like all of our issues are usually passed down. All trauma is ancestral. And it's not like some far out, like thousands of years ago, ancestry. It's, it's, it's hurt people, hurt people. Could you define trauma? Like what, yeah. what comes yeah. up? I think that would be super That's, helpful. Um, you know, the definition of words is so important. Trauma is, is um, it's not the things that are happening to you. And the same thing goes for stress. Stress is not the things that are happening to you. It's what's happening inside of you based on those things. Mm-hmm. And it's subjective. So, you know, something could happen to me that could be very traumatic to me 
Like it could be very hard for me and it could, it's, it's a trauma response, right? It's a stress response. And what's stressful to me might not be stressful to you. Maybe you've developed resilience and capacity and you've, you've, you've done a lot of hard things and you've overcome hard things. Trauma is actually what creates growth. Stress like is what creates growth, right? It's also the number one killer. And it's interesting. It's like we put a barbell on our back to stress ourselves, to actually, to actually heal from it and create muscle. We put that load, that resistance on us. We need that. Trauma is guaranteed, mm. right? And so we're going to come up against stress and different things, but it's like, how do we find a new adaptive response to it? How do we grow from it? It's a question. It's a question to our organism. How do we find the new adaptive response? And the question answered is finding that new pattern, finding that new way to deal with it. The question unanswered will continue to create symptoms. And those symptoms will continue to show up in a multitude of different ways. Maybe it's, it's, um, it's lashing out on the people that you love. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's, um, it's continuing to take different prescription medications that sort of masks those symptoms. And so I think on a collective level, we're experiencing like a lot of collective stressors. And so we're, as humanity, we're being asked a, a giant question. What's the new adaptive response? What's the way that we come together and grow from this? And we don't answer the question. We'll continue to experience symptoms. And those symptoms are the lashing out of different populations screaming for help. Going back to, if you'd be open to sharing a little bit, I'm curious, how has your parents received this work? Have they been open to it or what's, what's come up as they've known you've been doing more of this work out there? Yeah, I think in the beginning, um, like early on, you know, I th- I, I'm reflecting back as I just turned 31. I've been, I, I, I went down this route. It's been 10 years now. Wow. I started when I was 21. I went to school for body work and holistic health and understanding somatic psychology and all of that. Um, in the beginning, I, I came from that fix it mentality. I'm like, mom, you got to do this. Dad, you got to do this. Like you got to take care of yourself. Right. From that very, like um, me putting pressure on them. And uh, it actually, it actually caused a lot more issues. Like, cause it's, it's me saying, Hey, you need to do this. Cause you're actually broken. And me not really honoring like where they're at. You know, I tell the story that I was in the car with my mom and she, she was like, Hey, can we stop at the store and, and can you get me a diet Coke? I'm like, fuck no, I'm not going to like enable this poison. <laughs> right. Like you don't you drink some water. Right. And, <laughs> and, um, and I immediately felt her just completely shut down in the judgment of her son, looking at her as the choices that she's making as she's broken. Right. Mm. And so it immediately, like there was a disconnect and I could feel the amount of hurt that, that she felt by the pressure that I'm putting on her to, to show up in the way that I think that she should show up. Right. Wow. And so I stopped and just bought her the Diet Coke and like, cause who knows what that, I mean, the Diet Coke, obviously there's toxins and poisons and there's an aspect of me doing that every day and enabling her. But in that moment, giving that to her in the act of doing that, just showing that I accept her for where she's at and she's probably doing the best that she can with the circumstances, right? Because so many of us are just doing the best that we can. And it's the lack of community of, of like, of us all doing it together. You know, we have to do the work ourselves, but we don't, we shouldn't do it alone. Mm. You know, I just had a conversation with her yesterday and she's still struggling. You know, they've, they've, um, they've never, you know, I had a, three weeks ago, she called me from the hospital and, um, she said that she had an anxiety attack and that she, um, the first question the doctor asked her was, was, well, the doctor said that her blood pressure was that of someone who's dying. And, um, she doesn't really have anything else like going on. She's just incredibly stressed, incredibly suppressed. And uh, the first thing the doctor asked her was, are you even breathing? And so I like wonder, it's like, did I, I might've created this whole thing out of the, just the desire to help my parents, but maybe they never do it. Maybe they never, maybe 
they're the ones that never receive it. And so I have to be okay with that. And I try to like, you know, if you think you're in line, go spend a week with your, your family, right? There will always be our probably hardest teachers. Um, for me, at least I resonate with that. Um, but yeah, there's still, I can only show up and I can only work on myself. Right. And, uh, the door is always open. Um, but unfortunately they, uh, they, they, I've, I've offered many times, um, and they're not necessarily open to it yet, but who knows, I continue to, uh, operate from an optimistic place. People can change anytime at the drop of a pin. Thank you so much for sharing that. Like, I super, super appreciate that. And yeah, and really just super grateful, honestly, that our paths cross and the work that you're doing in the world. And I was sharing with you earlier that, yeah, it's been bringing me so much joy and fulfillment, being able to offer this type of breath work with clients and at the men's retreats. And like, mm. it's been uh, a big part of the work that's given me some of the most joy and fulfillment right now. And just want to thank you, man, for the work that you're doing and putting yourself out there and building this thing and, and allowing yourself also to be supported. Like you got a dope yeah. ass team and I'm so blessed, man, dude, I don't even know how it happened. <laughs> and it's like, I look around and I'm surrounded by the most incredible humans that, um, feel the same as me and want to continue this mission and feel a sense of purpose underneath it. And it's really allowed us to grow because there's sure as hell could not have done this by myself. Yeah. Dude. And, and before we close off, you had said something earlier too, in relation to that, you were saying, cause I was asking you, you know, you guys have taken off on some social media platforms and in different countries. And you had said something about when people see this work, uh, yeah. can you share, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, in relation to like sharing what we do on social media and, um, and I was always quite against like showing like very emotional, cathartic release content out in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, that's, that's sacred and that's private and it is sacred and, and it, it, but also that's contributing to, um, it not being okay to feel emotions in the world. And so I was actually against it. And a member of my team, she was like, Hey, you should actually like put out some of this stuff and show the world, like what, what you what you do. And so we had a, a very, uh, like uh, a video of a woman having quite an emotional release and we posted it. And overnight we had thousands of messages and our, and our social media has just started blowing up. And those messages were not predominantly in English. They were in a multitude of other different languages. And so myself and fish, we were on, you know, Google translate and we're like <laughs> trying to translate all these messages. And people were like, I, I, I need this. And it's interesting because before we were posting a lot of videos of me just teaching about the concepts and the conceptual stuff. And, you know, I could sit here and talk about it all day long on this podcast, but it's, it's really an, an experience, right? And it's, it's an experience. And so, um, not everyone in the world speaks the language of English or Spanish or whatever language that I'm speaking in, but everybody speaks the language of emotion. Every human feels very deeply. And every human craves to feel because that's our birthright. Like feeling is the opposite of feeling is numbness yeah. and numbness is actually a flat line, not feeling the lows. I don't have access to the highs. And so really it is a living death. Like it is, it's a very non-living existence. And so through that, I had the realization that the world wants to feel wow. the, 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 on a global level, the world wants to feel because they want to be alive. And so it's reflected, it's been reflected to us and we never had the sort of intention to like be a global uh, modality or a global brand. Um, but we have practitioners in that hold this work in a multitude of different languages. Um, we have people wanting to receive it all over the world. And it's just, a, it's just showing that the world really, the only reason why it's growing and it's blowing up is because the world wants it. And so that's to ask your, to answer your question of why do I do this? Cause the world wants it. 
A whole brother. A whole brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, thank you so much for your time, yeah. for your energy, man, for sharing. As we close off, if there's any final words that you want to share, please, Mike's yours, brother. But this has been yeah. so enjoyable and just thank you from the bottom of my heart, brother. Yeah. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you so much. Yeah. Breath is the only rhythm that we do consciously and unconsciously sit with that. You have a choice. You have a choice to be in a contracted state. You have a choice to be in an open state and you have the choice to change that at any time. And all of it, all it takes is just the quality of your breath. And so, yeah, sit with that. And uh, if you want to learn more, um, you can check us out at somaticbreathwork.com, somatic release on Instagram, myself, um, Steven Jaggers, uh, Jaggers JR on Instagram. Um, but we're across all platforms, somatic breathwork. And if you want to learn more, if you want to receive it, um, we have plenty of tracks on there that you can come to one of our live sessions or you can experience it uh, virtually as well. I mean, if you're a practitioner and you want to learn more about kind of utilizing this work, um, we have a multitude of different types of um, coaches and therapists. And if you're working with another human, um, you are a breath worker. And if someone is holding their breath, um, whatever you're trying to do with them is probably not landing. So uh, we have people, practitioners all across the, the scope of practice um, that are utilizing this and, and really enjoying it. So yeah, you can find me there. Hell yeah. Well, check them out, guys, for sure. I've been so pleased that I met this guy, got to connect with him and uh, continue learning from you, brother, and also growing our friendship, man. Yeah. Excited to do it again. Thanks, Mike. Yes, sir. Thanks for listening. Be sure to follow the podcast on Apple and leave a review. It means a lot. We all have a path and I'd love to hear how this podcast has inspired you in some way to live yours. 